Just one thing which I forgot to highlight um, in explaining the assessments, in the topics that I gave you for Old Testament theology, the essay, um, notice that I gave you any other negotiated topic. Um, so, if there's something that's a burning interest for you, or you're interested in following, please come and see me and we'll negotiate it. Not so much to send to the topic, but to make sure that it's manageable, it's not too big. Uh, likewise, for a foundational story, if you can think of some passage besides those that I've mentioned, and I've given you some of the most important ones that you'd like to look at as a foundational story or foundational word, um, uh, uh, see me if you want to do that. Now, um, I'm a, the first assignment that I'm getting you to do is on a foundational word or foundational story. What on earth do I mean by this? Let me explain. Now follow the handout here, and uh, if I can get it up high enough, get it. Sing. One of the biggest changes that's occurred in human history um, uh, has to do with the assumption of order in the world. Now, I could have, as, broad, as broadly as possible, for primitive people, primitive I don't mean in any negative sense, but people um, uh, uh, living before the Old Testament, the time of uh, 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 Judaism and Islam, the basic assumption was that the world, the cosmos, was chaotic. So chaos was primary, and the story always is then gods and human beings together establish order. Now, uh, one of the modern assumptions, and the whole project of modernism and postmodernism doesn't work unless you realize that it assumes without proving the fact that there is an inherent order in the world. It assumes even that chaos is orderly that there's an order to chaos, an intrinsic order. So um, uh, we modern human beings assume there's order, we try to discover the order, and we use it for our benefit. Uh, that's uh, the whole modern social, political, and intellectual cultural enterprise is built on that assumption. May I emphasize it is merely an ass assumption philosophically. You can't prove this order. You assume it and then try and demonstrate it uh, at various levels. Now the ancient assumption as I said was that there was disorder and that order was established by human beings and gods working together. Um, if I can use an agricultural analogy, um, the ancient assumption was that human beings lived in a jungle and uh, they cleared a small part of the jungle for them to, to establish their village and their gardens. But unless they kept on uh, working to keep the jungle at bay, the jungle would take over um, the order of the village and the order of the gardens. You get the basic picture? So you have disorder. In uh, um, physical, in terms of modern physics, if you like, the law of entropy applies, if you remember that from your physics. Uh, so there's basic disorder. Now, what's the basic teaching of the Old Testament? Is that right at the beginning, in creation, God established what kind of a world? An ordered world. And uh, if there was disorder, it doesn't come from God. And it doesn't come from God's creation, but it comes from human beings. Um, but coming on from this, then, the whole of the Old Testament and New Testament, from an ancient point of view, has to do with God's provision of order for his people. Now, I think this fits very much in a postmodern mentality. The catchword for um, my generation was freedom. I think the new catchword of your generation and the generation comes going to be order. 
Order not in a bad sense, but order in a good sense. It fits into modern ecological thinking, which basically is order thinking. You know, what's order? Now, let me explain this and its significance. The modern view of history sees the events of history operating as a chain of cause and effect, human cause and effect. So take, for example, the uh, economic collapse that we've seen going all around the world. Um, in the ancient world, people would have thought that this was the act of, an act of God or demons or bad luck or some other non-human agency. But we see this collapse as caused by greedy bankers. greedy bankers. It's interesting that we never say greedy me and my mortgages. <laughs> it's always somebody else. But we see it as a human cause having human effects. Can you see the way we do think in history? So historical events are uh, Hu uh, uh, have to do with human beings and so we think in terms of order that human beings create or disorder that human beings create. You see this is the way we view history um, and uh, as modern people our orientation isn't so much on the past but all of us look have the picture that the past is behind us and the future is in front of us. We're looking into the future. We're future-oriented automatically. That's what our culture does. Which, by the way, is nonsense because you can't see into the future. All you can see is the present and the past. One Old Testament scholar puts it brilliantly. He says that the way that the Old Testament and the Hebrew language looks at reality is as if we are walking backwards into the future. And you see where you're going by looking where you've come from. You see? That's the ancient way of understanding history, is walking backwards into the future. We have the idea that the past is behind us historically, and we're only interested in the present and in the future. So we are oriented towards the future. Um, the third basic assumption of modern understanding of history and historical events is that we uh, assume that God and supernatural agencies are not at work in human history. Um, there's an interesting little uh, bit of outrage that hit the news um, uh, uh, this, it, 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 the television news last night and the Australian this morning that I picked up. A guy who is uh, a Catholic priest has been appointed as the Archbishop of Linz in Austria by the Pope and this fellow um, uh, said that the uh, uh, cyclone Katrina in uh, Louisiana, what's it, uh, New Orleans, was God's judgment on that city for its immorality and its evil. Now, all modern and postmodern people are outraged. How could this event be caused by God, a judgment of God? Okay. Now, um, uh, two different ways of looking at history clashing here in a very dramatic way. Asia, they always see, and for uh, you ask Paul Obricht, Aboriginals don't see any natural events. Every event is supernatural. It has to do with spirits or demons or um, those kinds of things. In Asia, everything is assumed to be supernatural. Animism, yeah, and it has various stories to it. Animus, everything is supernatural. Aboriginals are animus. Um, uh, Mohammedans, everything is supernatural. It's the will of God. And I have no hesitation to saying that uh, you know, the financial collapse is the doing of Allah, Allah's judgment on the West, um, etc. So everything is the will of God. But um, the Enlightenment basically started off from this premise. Number one, since we cannot 
prove that God or angels or demons or any other supernatural agency is at work in the natural world, science, and in history. Therefore, we will try and understand history as if they are not at work. Can you see? It's an assumption. They can't prove it, but they merely assume it. And then they go on explaining events in uh, naturalistic ways. Now you need to see that all of us have, have been indoctrinated in that worldview, and it's by no means self-evident, and most people in the world would reject it out of hand. Now that's the modern worldview. And coming out of it then, um, uh, what's most important in human affairs, in human history, is politics. Politics is number one. Economics number two, and then there's number three and four. So, um, uh, let me just explain. Coming from the Enlightenment, the number one force at work in human history is politics. So we understand for the last two or three, four hundred years, basically uh, all histories have been written basically from a political point of view. Now, this was challenged uh, in the middle of the 19th century by a, a great thinker called Karl Marx who said, uh, politics doesn't come first. What comes first in human history? Money. Money, means of production, economics. So, the Enlightenment story was politics comes first, economics comes second, and then education comes third. And education is connected. Who basically is responsible for education? Not parents, not the family, but the state is responsible for education. And what do you educate people for? To be involved in the political and economic system. Now, um, this worldview um, is the dominant one, but however, within your own lifetime, it's shifted, within my lifetime rather, it's shifted. Now, the assumption is that economics is first. So, um, if you've been listening to what Mr. Rudd's been saying, he's been uh, bending over backward to say that he is not to blame for the recession or the whatever you call, name you give to the economic mess we've got. What's to blame? The system, economics. Now, the economics comes first. Economics explains everything. And uh, politics, if you like, is subordinate to economics. The business of government is to make sure the economy runs well. Both leaders in Australia um, would agree with that. That's Rudd's basic premise, but it's also the leader of the opposition's basic premise. Economics comes first. Politics second, and the new modern force, uh, which is just beginning to edge its way up, is that culture comes third. But in fact, there's quite a number of thinkers uh, in the universities who put culture not third, but put it second, and some even put it first. Uh, the big new discipline is cultural studies. Now, notice that these are all abstractions. There's no such thing as culture. It's an idea. There's no such thing as politics. That idea, economics is an idea. But these are our modern gods. But they are natural gods. We've made them in our own image. But what both this worldview and this worldview assume is that God is not at work in human affairs. Um, it assumes that human beings are their own gods. It can't prove it, it merely assumes it. And it's as if, if you like, taken for granted. Um, so the modern, if you like, view is with slightly different. These two forces are, are the powers at work to establish uh, to, uh, social order. So if you want to understand the way Australia runs as a society, you understand in terms of economics, politics, and culture. 
and with other forces you can explain by Various yes, well, they're all subordinate to this. Explain religious behaviour. Religion, where does religion fit in this thing? Politics and no, not politics, not economics. It's culture. It's just part of culture. Okay. And it's very small. In history, though, no, no, yeah, just different sort. Yes. It's always political or economic. Not always. Let okay. me tell you the traditional one. Yes, yes. In the modern place, modern place, where does religion fit in? Is that under Sorry, what? Well, in the modern place, what we're currently living through, where does religion fit? Um, Subordinate to culture, or is the it Enlightenment culture? tried to uh, uh, fit it into politics. Okay, in one of two ways: either by co-opting it and seeing that uh, in England the story, Enlightenment story, was that uh, 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 the religion, in that case the Church of England, served the interests of the nation of England. So it is subordinate to politics. So the Queen is not only the head of the state, but she's also the head of the church. Um, the French Revolution dealt with that problem by getting rid of religion altogether. Um, the Russian Revolution tried, basically tried to get rid of religion. It didn't see any role in religion. Ex okay, that's a different story. Yeah, right. I'm just trying to say um, big picture stuff. Um, the other place that the Enlightenment saw um, uh, religion as involved in the education of people and their, uh, the moral and uh, sentimental education of people. Sentimental was, you know, to um, people's uh, mentality, their subjectivity, to, 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 to turn people into good people, uh, who would be good citizens and good economic uh, agents. So religion is subordinate to either of these two. Um, I don't, now, in um, the postmodern world, which you, we are in, uh, religion fits basically, if it fits anywhere, is into this subcategory of culture and cultural studies. It's a cultural phenomenon. Now, contrast that to what I call the traditional worldview. Now, notice I'm not using the term ancient worldview because it's still all around us. Um, I'd say more than... Now, if you actually examine the way people lived in Australia, most Australians wouldn't live in this world or in this world. That's the world of public culture, television, the chattering classes. But most people live in this world. Now, in the ancient world, in the traditional world, religion is first, second, third. Religion dominates everything. You still see it in Islam. In Islamic society, there's no such thing as politics, economics, education, culture. All you have is religion. That's strict Islamic society. Um, but a religion comes first. The second factor in a traditional uh, worldview of understanding human order is to see that under religion you have ethnicity. Now notice I use the term ethnicity rather than family because we're not talking about nuclear family, we're talking about extended family tribe. And so ethnicity comes second. Now what ethnic group you belong to, now whether it's Welsh or Cornish or Scottish or uh, East Anglian or uh, uh, Adelaidean. Uh, ethnicity. Now, ethnicity, notice, includes the following factors. It includes family, in extended family sense, and tribe. Family, tribe. It includes economics. Do you know where that uh, word economics comes from? Oikonomia is housekeeping. And uh, housekeeping means it's, it's part of the domestic family domain. Um, until modern times, all businesses were basically family businesses. They were extension of the home. So economics wasn't basically seen to be a political thing or a separate entity itself, but economics was included within ethnicity. Um, uh, uh, and that particularly so before you get money culture, 
um, with money coming, which, which en enables and, uh, uh, the economy to, do, to be taken out of the family. Uh, the family is responsible for education, and all schools were, if you like, extensions of the family. Um, and culture basically has to do with ethnicity. Um, so that's the world I grew up in. You now the Brossa Valley. Uh, you know, we were part of an extended tribe there. We spoke our own lingo. We had our own history. Um, uh, economics was basically tied up with family. Uh, education was closely connected with family and church. Um, the culture was a family, ethnic, tribal kind of culture. And what mattered not was what you did, your occupation, but who your father, who your mother was. That's the telling uh, sort. Still, in. oh, as I said, this has not disappeared. Um, and politics then is an extension of the family. And it serves the interest of family and religion. So, if you like, uh, you get from a tribe, the tribal head is the political leader, and then, then from the tribal heads you get kings. The king is the father of the nation, the citizens are his children. You get that picture? So, monarchy is, is if you like, extending the principles of family into the political domain and engaging um, uh, in politics in family terms. And hence you get in, in, in Reddit. You know, how do you become a king? If your father's a king, you belong to that particular family. But what's important here, which we need to understand when we come to the Old Testament, is the, that religion is not kicked out of the equation, but is regarded as the primary factor. Everything is understood in religious terms. That comes first. Now, that's the basic assumption of uh, the Old Testament. And it was the basic assumption of my own family, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. And I still find myself split between, you know, uh, this. That's the way I feel. The way I think is like this or this. And that makes it difficult when I come to understand uh, Aborigines, or when I try and understand people up in New Guinea, or Malaysia, or Thailand, let alone the Old Testament. Yes. Uh, um, yep. so right? That tradition is what I'm used to. Oh, yeah. It's a lot more sense than the others. In fact, it makes better sense of reality. Because you deal with concrete things, you don't deal with abstractions. Uh, the Enlightenment gives primary, uh, primary reality not to real things, but to ideas. The Enlightenment has to do with ideas, concepts. It's abstract in its basic approach to life. Okay? Yeah. Yep. Like money comes to God, as political ideas come to God, religion's with you until you die, uh -huh. family. Yep. So, and that's the weakness in the modern approach modern sort of system, you can control economics, you can control politics, yes. you, can control God. you can't control God, and you can't control family, mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 you know, and then if, if that's connected with religion and family, then you can't control politics, because God, who determines whether some, a king, a royal family is going to continue or not? God does, and so there's always a problem in uh, monarchy, is whether kings have descendants or not. Just think of the story of Henry VIII or Elizabeth. Um, you know, uh, that's outside of human control. And then there's always, an, is, is which of the king's sons is going to be his successor? Um, well, that helps. And so you've got to lop some off to help, help the god or gods or the gods determine a successor. But also, um, the other two are very location-based. Yep. Obviously, if I left Australia to England, yes. the dollar is different, I have use pounds, yes. the political parties yes. are different, the cultures are completely different. So yep. you've got to reinvent yourself, whereas, yep. once again, you can come. Well, even if you have to move yourself to South Australia, I mean, it's the same sort of thing. Yep. Completely 
It's a different world. Because place in, in the traditional society, in a modern society, place is insignificant. We think internationally, globally, okay? Place is uh, an accident. It's not essential. But for me, in my living here, place is not accidental, it's primary. If you want to understand me, you've got to understand me in my location, my station and my vocation. And location is very important in this traditional point of view. And the older I get, the more I realize how important place is to me, very concretely. And I guess it's for all of you. I mean, say, we make jokes of it um, because it's so significant. Uh, so we have all the new students they come from. Queensland, Queensland and Chris claps. <laughs> it's not insignificant. <laughs> Okay, now, um, have you got, this is big picture stuff. Now, um, I want to build on this to try and explain uh, what I'm getting at. Are you with me thus far? Now, I'm interested in the traditional view of history. Not this view of history, but this view of history, okay? How do they understand human events? Um, well, uh, let me explain it just uh, 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 in two concrete examples. The first is from myself, from my own family. When I go to the Brossa Valley, which is the area that my ancestors settled, the first question they ask, no, if, no, let me go back. If I go to a party of my peers, that's people who are university educated, you know, tertiary professional people, the first question they ask when they hear, oh, hello, I'm John Kleinig, what do you do? That's what's significant there. If I... <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and if I happen to be... I'm in trouble if I happen to be a student or retired or only a housewife or, worst of all, a pastor. Uh, unemployed, yes. Okay. But go to the Brossa Valley. The first question is... Okay, you're John Kleinig. Before... Yes. Who is your father? And if they can't get any fix on father, they say, who was your, not, not who is your mother, who was your mother? Um, so you, if you listened yesterday, John Henderson did a bit of that. He said, Henderson, okay, that's no good. So, but I, <laughs> you, 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 did you see that kind of uh, uh, system coming? Okay. Um, in a traditional worldview, what matters is your family and your f the question of father, which has to do with origin. Origin is important. And there's two lots of origin, family origins and also place origin. Um, so people say, you know, you know, you're Kleinig, who's your father, Ben? Oh, you come from Neukirch, do you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that immediately, you come from the Brossa Valley. That's significant. Second way in which it shows. Um, uh, for most Lutherans in Australia, if you ask the question, how come there is a Lutheran church in Australia, we have a very clear story to tell. What's the story for the origin of the Lutheran world of uh, Lutheran Church of Australia, Lutheran community in Australia? Tom? Uh, well, we uh, came here from Germany to escape religious persecution. Good. That's our foundational story. And the two founding fathers then are Carvel and Fritzsche. That's not a Carvel story. Though. Do you realize, his, historically speaking, is, is, is from modern historiography is quite inaccurate. It's not only partly true, it's, it's not true. Because there were Lutherans in Australia. There was, in fact, a Lutheran church in Australia before Carvel and Fritzsche came here. Up in Queensland. And there were missionaries here. Tycom and Sherman were here already. When I learned about Lutheran yeah. history yeah. Um, up, in, up at Concordia, we yes. never were taught that they were um, standing persecution or anything. It was uh, missionaries and stuff coming through Queensland. Right, and yeah. it was the story was Nambour then. Yeah, yeah. I don't, you see, that's a different foundational story. But that's still a foundational story. In fact, uh, before the missionaries came, there were already Lutherans, people of Lutheran background there. Um, but can you see uh, uh, 
the way we instinctively uh, understand ourselves is not in terms of historical, strict historical cause and effect, but we think in terms of foundations. Who was the founding father of this community? What's our foundational story? Right? So the story of Nambo is very important for the, the church up in Queensland, and we automatically assume that our story here in the south is your story, which is not true. Although it's true for some people up there on the downs, because they migrated from the south and went up there. I don't know if the Janetskis were uh, came from the south. I think they did originally. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh you won't concede that. Ah. Okay. Now, following on from that. Uh, now, traditionally. Um, uh, people instinctively think in terms of foundations, founders, foundational events, foundational stories. Um, you can think in terms of human founders, but then also divine founders. So if you took, for example, the story of the missionaries up to Nambour, um, it wasn't so much that they decided to become uh, missionaries and to go there, but they believed that God called them and God sent them to work with the Aboriginal community there. So part of that foundational story of the church in Queensland is God's foundation, God's call. Likewise down here with Carvel and Fritchie, their story was that God called them and God sent them here to establish um, congregations, a church here in South Australia. Somebody had a hand up? No? Did you? Okay. So um, the importance of divine and human events. Now, the beginning then, in this way of thinking, the beginning is not behind us, but the beginning is still very significant. The beginning, if you like, is the foundation of the building. The building, a building doesn't leave the foundation behind, but it is built on that foundation and will always be built on that foundation. The foundational event sets the beginning, sets a precedent for subsequent um, history. Now, notice the importance of precedent in this way of thinking. What was done then established a precedent for what we do now. Let me give you two cases of foundational events in the Old Testament. Uh, the one great positive foundational event that founded Israel as the holy people of God was the exodus from Egypt. Before the exodus from Egypt, the Israelites were an ethnic group, basically the family of Jacob and their descendants. But God, intervening, established them as a holy nation through the exodus and at Mount Sinai. This is a foundational event, and it's not just significant in the past, but it has ongoing significance throughout the whole of Jewish history. Positive foundational events. And that's God's doing. Now, to take it negatively, um, when, if you read the Book of Kings, you find out that uh, after the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split into two political entities. There was the southern kingdom under the house of David, the dynasty of David, and then there was a northern dynasty under Jeroboam. He led the rebellion against Rehoboam, the grandson of David, and he established his own form of kingship in the north. And as part of his way of establishing it, he didn't have a temple of Solomon, he didn't have the priests, so he established um, two shrines, one in Bethel and the other one in Dan, and he established the uh, divine service that was focused around the golden calf. And so the book of Kings talks about the sin of Jeroboam. And all subsequent kings in the northern kingdom built on that foundation. Did, have you noticed have, um, that he sinned with the sin of Jeroboam? The sin of Jeroboam. The sin of Jeroboam. You get it again and again up there in the north. So that act of idolatry was a foundational event negatively putting the northern kingdom on shonky, not shonky political foundations. He was a brilliant politician, but he was a bad theologian. 
because what he wanted to do was to give religious foundations that would not just unify the ten or uh, so ten and a half northern tribes of Israel but he wanted to bring in the Canaanites as well hence his establishment of the golden calf he wanted to be syncretistic, inclusive, a good missionary. Uh -huh. yeah. So can you see that that's a foundational event, the sin of Jeroboam. Um, now, just to finish this, uh, uh, so the foundational event is not just something that's in the past causing, but it, is, it uh, 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 remains and the future is the fulfillment of what was established there. So what was established as the foundation then becomes the foundation for the bit subsequent building and part of the subsequent building and upholds the subsequent building. Uh, two, two pictures that are used. The foundation event is the embryo from which you get the body developing. Or the foundational event is the seed from which you get the plant developing. The seed contains the plant in embryonic form. So the understanding is that everything that subsequently develops is contained already there in the foundational event. And the understanding is if you establish a human institution on good foundations you'll get a good history. But if you establish on rotten foundations you have a rotten history. Yes? Just on that inference there, like I'm just confused because we ourselves descend from Adam and Eve and they fell into sin, so does that leave us with no help? No, no hope and John Henderson doesn't have a losing name, does that leave him with no place to go? Okay. Because his history and that foundational event. But well, there's a difference between um, foundational events, if you like, in traditional society and modern society. Um, but if I can just explain Adam and Eve, the basic foundational event is not the fall, it's a negative foundational, and you need to understand that as a foundational event, but what's the positive foundational event? Creation. God's creation of Adam and Eve and God's blessing, I think yesterday, God's blessing of Adam and Eve. That's foundational. It's so foundational that not, it's such a good foundation that not even human sin can arise that good foundation. Or take another case, where does marriage come from? Is it after the fall? Is it the result of human lust and uh, uh, inability to control themselves sexually? No, it occurs before the fall. God created Adam and Eve and he uh, brought them together and he said it's not good for man to be alone, I will make a helper fit for him. So marriage itself is established on divine foundations. And if you want to understand marriage, where do you look? Back there. Um, and it's such a good foundation that even human beings, even modern human beings with divorce and promiscuity and all the chaos we have, can't undo that good foundation. You see? It's foundational. Um, uh, what this way of his understanding history does is to understand and help to explain how God and supernatural powers are at work in human history. It gives place to God. It doesn't simplify things. You know, human beings are involved. Um, but it gives room for understanding how God is at work significantly in human beings. How angels, demons, other supernatural powers are at work. Um, and lastly, before we have the break, uh, it leads then to the primacy of religion over uh, everything else, politics and economics. In that way of thinking, what's most significant is not human foundations, not political or economic foundations, but religious foundations, God's foundations for politics and economics and family and everything else that's significant in human history. Now, the significant word in this way of thinking is the word arche. In Greek, what does it mean? Beginning. But it's not just beginning in chronology, but it means also the basis, the foundation, the first principle, the first thing, the arche. 
in the beginning was the word doesn't just mean that uh, the word was there in the beginning of time or eternity but it remains there as the foundation for everything in human history uh, the Hebrew word for that is Reshith remember how Genesis begins Bereshith in the beginning or as the beginning God created the heavens and the earth now that's not just the first act of all but it is the foundation for everything in creation so always you start off with in the beginning God created not just human beings not just animals not just the earth not just heaven but he created the heaven and the earth that's the foundation for everything I'll be um, developing that a little bit further next period but try and get your head around this way of thinking I find it very very useful and helpful